Okay, I think we are live. Hello. <laughs> Welcome to the live stream. I've got this um, new kind of big widescreen webcam on here so you can see pretty much my whole sewing room. <laughs> so really welcome. All right, we'll kind of go slow, let people trickle in and then kind of get started on the live stream. So I'm in my control panel. I think the chat is a little bit delayed on this side. So, you know, let me know any questions you guys have or anything that's going on. I'll probably see it slightly after you post it. Awesome. So today we're going to talk about kind of how moving in is going. I've got like a preview of my new workspace here. And I'm going to talk about some of my upcoming projects, some things that I have in store for you guys, and just kind of how stuff is going in general. So, yay. So, yeah, I'm so excited to share what I'm working on, too. So it's been a little bit hectic. Obviously, moving takes a lot of the priority of what's going on. You can kind of see there's some boxes and stuff. Um, I don't have anything up on the walls yet. That is coming as I sort of get things situated and see how I like everything. Um, I've been kind of working in the space a little bit to see just how I move around and how it works for me. So I've been kind of shifting and shimmying things here and there to make it optimal. But it's going to be so much better than the last space. It's totally dedicated to sewing, and I'm very excited. Cool. So let's see. We'll just kind of give people a couple of minutes, I guess. Let a few people come in and join us. <laughs> and if you guys have projects to work on, also let me know what you're working on. And I would love to hear that too. Um, I will start by kind of getting out one project that I thought I might. So a little bit with our live stream, but we'll see how that goes because sewing and talking together, you know, two different things that <laughs> take my concentration. So we'll see. So the first project that I have here that I'm going to share with you guys so we can kind of have it out for a while is this big red mess. So maybe you can guess what this is <laughs> from some projects that have been ongoing for a while. Um, in fact, there was a matching medieval purse that looks just like this, that is the same fabric with the same sequins. So this is my medieval strawberry dress. It is in progress. I'm very excited. And this is actually made from my medieval kirtle pattern tutorial that I have available. It's kind of the standard one that I use for all the medieval dresses that I make. And so this is kind of hard to see on video or on webcam. <laughs> and but you can kind of see like it's a fitted front dress. And sequins have been going on sort of during construction process. And what I'm doing right now today is I'm sewing on this cord. So this is a finger loop cord, and I have a tutorial on my channel for how I do finger loop braid, like finger loop medieval cord. There's many different ways you can do finger loop braid. Um, I do usually a pretty straightforward one. It's five loops. It's really easy to do um, just with your hands pretty much anywhere. Um, they went up to many, many strands. In fact, sometimes you have cords that took multiple people to create. Um, this one you can do by yourself, and that's why I like it. So I am actually sewing this onto the edge of my dress. And that's something you see in a lot of medieval textiles. You'll see some sort of cord. Um, be it maybe tablet woven, you can do finger loop cord. There's, you know, different ways to make a cord. 
in the Middle Ages. And you'll see that a lot of times sewn onto the edge to kind of finish the edge of the garment. So that's what I'm working on right now. And <laughs> this dress is taking forever to make because there's so much going on with it. Um, I've hand stitched the hems already. You know, all these are hand stitched on. This is, I had to make all the cord, which is going around the edges and I'm stitching it on and I've got buttons to make buttonholes. So <laughs> there's a little bit left, but we're getting there. Um, so yeah. And how am I attaching this is a really good question. So I'm basically whip stitching over the raw edges. Yeah. So there's there's a little bit of difference from like a standard whip stitch and how I'm doing it because I'm trying to catch the cord in here. So I have just whip stitched cords on before plenty of times and that works great in this one um, to make it kind of stand out from the edge more. I'm actually, I don't know how well you can see this in the resolution, but I'm kind of taking the needle and grabbing the closest part so like the closest strand basically so I'm not going around the whole thing just that little part that's close to the edge and then I am stitching that part onto the edge of the garment so it's kind of whip stitching around it without going around the entire cord um, and I'm finding that works really well to give it that little standout kind of detail versus just kind of whipping it all down. And that's also because this cord isn't perfectly round, right? This cord is kind of like flat on one edge. So I think it looks really nice that way. Cool. So yeah, this is kind of a big <laughs> long-term project. Um, sometimes I get these project ideas and I'm like, this is going to be so fun and I'm just going to do it. And then I decide I want to do things by hand or like put extra details in it, embellish it in extra ways, and it ends up taking forever. So <laughs> that's fine though. I mean, where am I going to wear it right now? I mean, upcoming soon there will be stuff, but it's not like I had a deadline. So it's totally fine. So we will kind of work on this while we chat for a little bit or I'll try to work on it. We're gonna see how the attention goes. Um, yeah, so here's another stitch. Awesome. All right, so this is the biggest in the background project that continues to go on and on, the strawberry dress. It is actually almost done, I'm excited. And another thing about this project is that I actually asked, I pulled the interwebs to see um, if I should make the buttons out of this same fabric or out of a gold silk. And it was pretty mixed. Like a lot of people liked both of them, but there were more for the gold silk. So it's going to get gold silk buttons. So I'm excited. All right. Awesome. So let's talk about the next upcoming project. So there is someone in the background here with me and she is wearing a dark red cape right now because um, her dress is actually not to be seen yet until it's actually time to view it. So this project is a medieval it's like late Middle Ages, like 15th century project. And <laughs> I think you guys can tell from the hair colors what character it is. Um, it's it's not really a secret. Like I haven't been talking a whole lot about it. I've actually been using this project to test out my workspace here since I've moved. I've done it all in the new place. And <laughs> she's actually mostly done. There's like one detail that... I have to do that's not even part of the dress and um so she's a popular villain and <laughs> uh, yep yeah, it she's been guessed already <laughs> because i think it's pretty obvious with the black and white hair um so this is actually a medieval cruella and i'm so excited <laughs> i actually was hoping i would 
um, do the reveal and just kind of like throw her out there and surprise everybody really quickly. But I got a little bit derailed. I had some phone issues. My phone actually isn't even working right now. I'm waiting for a replacement phone to come in the mail. And I use that as my remote for filming. So I have to wait for that to come before I actually film the reveal. But the dress itself is done underneath that sheet. And I'm excited to show you guys what it looks like. I actually, I'm really excited about it. <laughs> like, real excited. Um, so her hair, she's got it up in these like buns with hair nets. That's the one part you can see. There's one more part of the hat too. And this is based on a 15th century style that's known as a hoopalond. So it's basically worn over top of the kirtle. Um, kirtle. This isn't the one that goes under that, but um, this is like an outer gown with big fancy sleeves. And um, what's really exciting about that too is that I'm actually putting together a PDF tutorial for the hoopalond, which you can't see. I know I'm pointing at it. The thing that's under wraps right now, um, it's kind of similar to what I've put together for the medieval kirtle. So it's going to go through kind of like what are all of your measurements so you can size the pieces custom to fit you and you can do a few different variations. Um, I'm pretty excited. <laughs> so I've been working on that in Illustrator and on the, the desktop computer for a while. That's been something I've been doing without having phone access. Definitely can still work on patterns and write-ups. So very cool. Um, very excited to reveal Cruella. So definitely that's a big thing. Um, and we'll talk more about the tutorials and some of those resources that I have coming out in a little bit once we go through some of the upcoming projects. But just to kind of like throw out the Hoopalon stuff right away for you guys, um, it's going to be a pretty comprehensive document. <laughs> it's already, already I can tell you it's going to be about 40 pages. Um, it's, I definitely got to writing. And um, that one is going to go through the whole dress. And then there's a headpiece. There's actually a little bit more to the hat that I'm going to go ahead and put on Patreon because it's kind of like speculative and not necessarily... <laughs> a perfectly period way to make the hat, but I think it worked out really well. Um, the part you can't see as far as I know is that, but I kind of rigged the hair nets a little bit. So I'm going to put all that stuff on Patreon. So it's kind of like an extra. Um, and then the hoopalond itself will be, you know, you can do so many different types of gowns out of the hoopalond instructions, just like the kirtle. I feel like it's a really good, like comprehensive starting point. Um, cool. Yeah. So I think one thing we can talk about, definitely, thank you for this question. Uh, what is the difference between a hoopalond and a coat hardy? So this is a really good question. So basically, there's lots of different names for garments in the Middle Ages, right? We're, I think some of the ones we're familiar with are like kirtle, coat hardy, hoopalon. So basically, a kirtle is like a fitted dress, right? And it can refer to a few different dresses. So the medieval kirtle instructions I have is basically a fitted garment, right? Like it's fitted through the body and then it flares out in the skirt and you can have short sleeves, long sleeves, you can vary the sleeves, you can do different details with it. It's kind of like that quintessential medieval dress, right? Like when we think medieval pictures, we think of that sort of fitted torso, big skirt, or at least late middle ages, right? Early middle ages, maybe more like tunics, but I feel like that's kind of, at least what I think of when I think of Middle Ages. Um, so coat hardy is another term. So in a lot of the period sources, we see coat hardy referring to male garments. And honestly, we see just like gown referring to everyone's dress because it's just a gown or even a suit to refer to the whole thing. Um, 
so a code hardy basically is the medieval version of the kirtle right so it's the fitted in the torso flaring out toward the bottom um, and those can be shorter on men or longer on women so the hoopalond is actually another overgarment so a code hardy can be an overgarment as well the hoopalond can actually be another overgarment so we really like outer gowns right now and Hoopalon is typically characterized by big sleeves. So like those really long, flowing, voluminous sleeves from the late Middle Ages. Um, a hoopalon is just flared out. So it's not fitted in the torso. It's just pretty much flared. You know, it's very voluminous and it's belted at the waist. So on men's hoopalons, we tend to see them belted like at the actual waist. And on women's hoopalons, we tend to see them belted higher up, like at the underbust. Um, and a lot of times when you have like a really thick belt, um, it'll want to kind of sit and not go lower than your natural waist. So you can kind of easily make it sit a little bit higher. And, you know, you can even use your natural waist to stop it. You can fit it more at your underbust. There's kind of some options. Um, and you see a little variation in paintings. And then if we want to keep rambling, because I can ramble forever, one more point, though, on the whole Code Hardy, Hoopalond, Curdle thing. Um, it's kind of transitional. So it's not just like everyone's like, today we're wearing Code Hardies, tomorrow we're wearing Hoopalons, right? So there's a lot of transitional differences as you go from one style to another so you'll even see pictures where you know it's fitted in the body it looks like the older coat hardies or the older kirtle styles yet it has like hoopalon sleeves and stuff like that so you'll see a lot of adaptations going from one to the other and that's one thing i like actually about having both of these comprehensive instructions available because i feel like you could combine both of that and have you know, the medieval world is your oyster, I guess, if we want to bring a fun saying into it. Cool. Um, so there's a question here from Anna or Anna Camila um, on any advice for sewing by hand and also hi. <laughs> um, so hand sewing I feel like the biggest advice from my personal perspective is to have patience and to be just kind with yourself to get going. Because um, there's so much d different, you know, techniques and stuff depending on what you're doing. And sometimes they take a lot of time and a little bit of effort to kind of get it right. Um, and I guess. I guess the biggest thing is to kind of take it at a pace that works for you, right? So like, if you want to sew a particular garment, at least this is what works for me a lot. So I'm going to give you guys a lot of personal stuff and a little bit of kind of what I've helped some other people with. Um, I find that it's very good motivation to work on a project and kind of see like what you need for that project, right? So if you're working on a specific dress and you need to know like how to fell the seams by hand, then look up like hand felling the seams. Um, I'm actually going to plug a friend of mine. Um, so thimble and plume, I'll have to put them in the description. I think once the live stream ends, I can probably put that in the description, but um, if someone can find thimble and plume on YouTube, they specialize in German Renaissance and it's actually, there's a couple of people that run Thimble and Plume. Um, one of them you'll see in their YouTube videos and these are my friends. They're very cool people and they're giving a lot of tips on hand sewing. So obviously you can kind of Google or search in YouTube for any specific things, but I feel like sending you guys to their channel is something I feel confident in giving you just like some general hand sewing techniques. Um, and on that note, like, oh, also <laughs> on Wednesdays, we wear hoopalons. I love that. So 
<laughs> if you guys didn't see, I did um, part of a collaboration for like Renaissance Mean Girls recently. Um, I think it was like a week and a half ago or something that it came a week and a half ago. Yeah. And, um, you know, on Wednesdays we were pink. Now we can say on Wednesdays we were hoopalons. And I really like it. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, and coming up sort of in the hand sewing, how to make hand sewing more ergonomic. Um, yeah, that's definitely something we want to think about. I, I could probably think about that more myself as well. Um, let's kind of see what I'm doing right now. So I've got this, this cord right here, right? So it, one thing that's helped me here is sitting up in a chair. So <laughs> yeah, I know we're going to go back to Mean Girls, Karen. Uh, it's like I have ESPN or something. That's actually how I know how to hand sew. It's my ESPN. I'm, I'm like psychic. <laughs> so uh, yeah, sitting yourself in a good position is definitely helpful for just getting ergonomic. So a lot of times I'll just like break out the hand sewing and like sit out on the floor and like hunch over it. And it's terrible. Like don't do that. But I do it all the time. So like sitting yourself up. Um, for me, a lot of what will get me is my back, like if I'm hunching or something. So making sure you're sitting up. So like a chair with a back helps me a lot. Um, sometimes I'll get some pillows, even if I have to sit on the floor and just kind of make myself a little pillow fort just so I can actually like, sit up and lean on them and not be hunching like I want to do for some reason. And then you want to make sure that you're comfortable throughout your hands. So my, I'm not like an ergonomics doctor or anything. Um, there's a lot of things I feel like I can learn about this as well. But the one thing that I have to kind of make sure I pay attention to is how it feels, right? So I have a tendency to get to work and like really want to work on my project and not even think about how it's affecting me physically. So something that I definitely want to recommend is take the time to see how it feels in your body. So if you're doing your stitches and your hand is cramping, that's your body telling you something's wrong with the position and you need to change it. So whether maybe, you know, you're like hunching your hand in a weird way, maybe like you can kind of straighten out your hand or something. That's my number one tip is pay attention and listen to your body because it's so easy not to and to just like get all focused on the project. Yeah, hunched, hunched over your cross stitch grapes. Oh, no. Well, a cross stitch grape sounds really cool. but. Yeah, I, I'm a hunter and it's a problem. So I just kind of make myself not hunch. And I feel like that's kind of the backbone, because huh, it's my backbone. It's the backbone of the ergonomic issues for me. And that is a very good hand sewing um, advice in general, as well as a sewing advice in general, right? Like it's, harder to be like hunched and weird over a sewing machine, but you definitely can. I have definitely managed to do that. Um, <laughs> but you want to make sure when you're sitting at your sewing machine as well. I know I'm just like going on a tangent now. Um, make sure that, you know, you're at a comfortable height. So you're not like, oh, or you're like trying to get in there and it's too low or something. You want to make sure just like when you sit at the computer, right, that you can reach everything on like a comfortable level, get on a comfortable level. Um, let's see. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> McNerdy. Um, yeah, never using a thimble. It, yeah, there's definitely like a, a culture of like you need to use a thimble because it's better for you. Um, I am a no thimble rebel because, <laughs> because ever since I was really little, um, my mom did start me on with a thimble when I was a kid 
And I just couldn't feel what I was doing. Like I would be like, oh, the thimble's in the way. And I tried putting it on different fingers. Like I tried thinking like, okay, I'm really hitting this finger. Let me try putting it on that finger. And for me, you know, I just got so used to sewing without a thimble because it was going better without a thimble from the start. Now I am decades into this habit. So, you know, can't teach an old dog new tricks as they say, or can't teach an old medievalist new tricks. I don't know. (laughs) Um, Yeah, so we're in that club together here. So I feel like we definitely are chatting about all kinds of cool stuff. I sewed one more stitch. I think I've sewn three stitches so far. So yay, that's really, really productive. Um, (laughs) Shoot my own horn there about how productive I'm being. Three stitches. So I wanted to talk a little bit about some more projects that are upcoming. So I am definitely feeling the going back into medieval stuff combined with fantasy lately. So I've always kind of done fantasy stuff and cosplay and also medieval So I'm in the Society for Creative Anachronism, which is a medieval and Renaissance reenactment group. And that gives me a place to wear all of this stuff. In addition to obviously Ren Faire, right? I love going to Ren Faire. I feel like that's more of like a fantasy environment, which is also my thing. So I'm kind of feeling bringing everything together lately and doing a lot of like fantasy historical kind of stuff. Um, like this lady behind me, Medieval Cruella, is a great example of that. Um, in some ways, I guess, Mean Girls Karen kind of was. It was a, a historic outfit that I had already made that I put on, but, you know, it was kind of fantasy, too. So some upcoming stuff. I guess the strawberry dress is kind of like that, too. Everything's kind of in that theme lately. Um, the strawberry dress is more of a take on a modern dress, but I decided to be a strawberry instead of having strawberries on me. Um, Because why not be a strawberry, right? Because you are what you eat, and I do eat strawberries. Um, So tangents aside, (laughs) I am going to work on some more of that type of stuff coming up. So I've got, so you guys know the Elsa dress I did, or maybe you know, I don't know if you saw it, but like, in a couple of months ago, I put out the videos and I have a lot of photos too of a, like a historic Elsa. So I took Elsa from Frozen and this is something I'd wanted to do for a while. I made her essentially like the 1840s, you know, what we now have adapted into folk dress. So, um, and Nor- Elsa is Norwegian. So that's known as the Bunad in Norway. Um, you have different variations. So, you know, folk dress everywhere. Um, I know in Sweden, it's called folk dress. In Germany, they have the dirndl. So this is really exciting. Um, I'm actually going to do another one of those. And it's kind of in line with putting out the pattern for the folk dress. So I'm going to do Anna. (laughs) So I'm sticking with Frozen again. Um, I actually have some fabrics for it. I have most of the fabrics. I think there's like a couple I'm going to need to supplement, but I had gone through my storage a couple of months ago and I weeded a lot of stuff out of there and I pulled out most of the fabrics I will need to make an Anna folk dress. So we are putting Anna also in the 1840s in sort of the precursor to folk dress. And so basically a bunad, but, you know, the word bunad is more modern, but, um, you know, that's what we would know it as now today. Um, oh yeah. (laughs) Fabric sneak peek. I know I actually have the fabric in a box right now for moving. So I'm very sorry. I don't have it out. Um, I think I know where it is, but it's under some stuff, but it'll be coming. (laughs) Maybe I can take a picture of it when I get that box unpacked. Um, So I'm pretty excited about that. And and that'll be 
uh, you know, that's obviously not the next one because it's still in a box, but it'll be coming. And I think that'll be really cool because I'm also going to do more with this folk dress kind of thing. So <laughs> I really like folk dresses. And I always have since I was a little kid, you know, we would go. So my mom is from Sweden and we would go over there to visit my family and uh, like, you know, at midsummer and stuff like festivals, you always see people wearing folk dresses. And I always, always wanted one. And so I definitely want to do more with the folk dress concepts. And <laughs> okay, I'm kind of laughing at myself because technically I did a folk dress from, you know, my home district of Ikea for April Fools. Um, so there was another one. <laughs> another one. Um, but the Anna dress is going to kind of coincide with also giving you guys a pattern and instructions to make a folk dress. So with Anna, I'm going to add a little bit to what I did with Elsa and kind of fill in a little bit so that not only am I going to give a nice project and a vlog of the project, but also I'll have some material to fill in more comprehensive instructions. So I'm really excited about that. Um, and also, will I be doing other historically accurate Disney stuff? Also, thank you so much. I, on um, you know, Elsa was absolutely gorgeous. McNerdy says, I, I really love Elsa. Like, uh, that dress, it just makes me feel so pretty. It's, you know, I know it's not like the big Renaissance gowns and stuff, but to me, that's like just something that since I was a kid, I saw people wearing around me at festivals and I thought it was so beautiful. Um, it's just those types of folk dresses and stuff. And so I am, in fact, going to do more historically accurate Disney. I'm going to take a drink of my coffee because <laughs> I'm like talking myself hoarse here. <clears throat> so Cruella, obviously the next historically accurate Disney, but she is by no means the only one. And also Anna, the upcoming Anna. Um, that is something that I'm going to have ongoing is more historically accurate Disney. And <laughs> so one of them, I am not going to give away everything about everything, right? There's some secrets, but um, the next one that I want to get working on in addition to Anna is going to be set in the Middle Ages. So another another medieval one and another sort of like kirtle design, coat hardy. And that's going to be a very brave princess. <laughs> so I'll let you guess. <laughs> I feel like so proud of myself sometimes for these puns. It's just dad jokes. Like I'm going to be everyone's dad with these jokes. So that one I'm very excited about because I'm looking at learning how to dye with um, natural dyes. So one thing that I haven't gotten super into is dyeing. And that's because I just, you know, I buy fabrics in the color I want. I have really had a reason to dye. But it's really exciting looking at natural dyes because like from my chemistry background as well, I can really get into like what the molecules are and what they're doing. So that's another sort of personal interest that's coming into costuming a little bit. So very excited about that. Um, and as far as what the future holds, I think that historical Disney is sticking around. Um, <laughs> there is another one that I had actually thought I was going to do for Dragon Con the year prior, the year that we ended up having quarantine. Um, and I had started planning out a, this one was not going to be medieval, but I had started planning out an aerial dress. And I was actually very excited about it. And I still am going to go through with that. Um, it's going to be kind of playing off of a fancier style. Um, there's like silks and stuff involved. So that was definitely like a long-term kind of save up and build up sort of project. Um, I don't have a timeline on her now 
because I kind of lost interest when everything got canceled, but she's still in the works too. Um, and in terms of more too, I think it's going to stick around. So I think if you like historical Disney, we're going to bond over that for plenty of time to come. It's not going anywhere. <laughs> So, yeah, Disney, another thing I've been into since I was a little kid. Um, <laughs> we actually used to live in Orlando when I was really little or right out right outside Orlando. Actually, we lived basically next to Disney and we went a lot, you know, back th back then, you know, in the old days when it wasn't as expensive to go to Disney um, and we could get like a season pass real cheap. Um, at different times, we've had friends that have worked there that, you know, sometimes we could go with them. Um, we, we went to Disney a lot and <laughs> it's definitely like in my soul. Um, and we definitely watched the movies and stuff for a long time after that. Oh, oh, thank you. Everyone I think wants to hear they're beautiful and I appreciate that very much. Um, oh, another thing, I've got a list here of things to make sure I remember to say. Um, another thing that I have coming out for you guys is, oh, I feel like, okay, I feel like we'll come right back to this one. Um, so I'm working on putting out some materials for another period that I do within the Society for Creative Anachronism that I haven't really shown so much like on my YouTube channel yet. So <laughs> I live in the South right now. It is quite warm here. A lot of the like Renaissance and medieval stuff that I really like to do is very, very warm. Um, and it inspired me to look into, so there's two, there's two reasons why I kind of get into costuming a period. Either I really love the costumes or I really love the culture or something about the people or the characters that are wearing it. So in this case, when looking for what I wanted to explore in the warm weather, I actually got into a culture that I've always been interested in since I was little, and that is ancient Egypt. So if you guys, if any of you have followed me for a while, you've probably seen some of that stuff. Um, obviously, I haven't gone to events for a while, so I haven't had a place to really wear any of that. But I do have a tutorial already on how to make... Um, an Egyptian, basically a sheath dress, like the kind of the popular one. Um, and that's been something that I've been passionate about is encouraging like the awareness of ancient Egyptian culture and costuming for me, costuming, right? This is a costuming channel. Um, and I've been working with that within the SCA, especially. So what I did is before I moved, I used to live in an area where it was about 45 minutes from a sand dune park. So I actually took some of my Egyptian dresses out to the sand dune park and shot some footage of them. And I'm planning to use that in a more comprehensive video to show you guys more about what I've come up with for Egyptian stuff. And hopefully you'll like that too. <laughs> I feel like I could ramble about this for a while too, because it's another thing that I'm really passionate about. Um, you know, I love seeing that kind of stuff like in museums and all kinds of, you know, places that we can see it. Um, let's see. Yeah. Cool. So that's kind of the one non-Disney thing, I guess, that I have to announce right now. Um, wow, it's already been like 39 minutes. We are totally chatting. <laughs> um, so I wanted to talk a little bit about like instructions and stuff and Oh yeah, that's where this question is going to help bring us back to. So 
Um, Kayla is, or McNerdy in the chat here, is currently working on her own curdle and using my PDF. I'm so glad that you're liking it. Yay. Um, so Kayla says the fit was so perfect and the mock-up didn't even need any changes. So that's awesome. Like that is the absolute ideal, right? Like you make a mock-up and it fits perfectly. Like if that happened every time that I made something, I would like, oh, so good. <laughs> I would I would be so happy. <laughs> um, I tend to make mock-ups that are a lot of times working mock-ups that like I can wear also, even if it's not perfect, you know, I like to do that a lot. But so the the PDF for the curdle, which is similar to the PDF for the hoopalon that's coming out, it, it's similar because they're both medieval dresses, right? They're very, very similar. Um, they're just different styles, you know. So, but in terms of like the look of the tutorial, it's it's similar, um, you know, image wise and like how the steps are laid out and stuff like that. So the way that I've made these tutorials for these dresses is because of the way that they have to be fitted to you, right? So like you could take a commercial pattern or something and you still need to make a mock-up and fit it. But I've found for myself as well as for a lot of the people that I've worked with over the years. So especially in the SCA, I've worked with a lot of people that, oh, they want to make a medieval dress. and. I happen to know how to do that. So I might be a resource. <laughs> so it helps so much if you start with it based on your proportions, right? So if you start with it based on your proportions, theoretically, you have less to change in your mock-up. Now, sometimes you're going to get lucky like Kayla, and you're going to be like, my mock-up is perfect straight out of the gate. And sometimes you're going to have a few things to fit here and there. But with using your custom measurements um, to size the, the pieces that are laid out for you in the diagram, it gives you the chance for quicker success, basically. It gives you the opportunity to start with something that's already proportioned to you and then make tweaks rather, rather than changing uh, like the whole pattern itself, right? So I feel like that's something that's really important for getting that perfect fit without giving yourself a total headache, right? Because who wants a total headache? Uh, Boyan, Boyan, Bojan? I'm not sure. I feel like it's Boyan, but I'm not sure. Boyan says that I'm a princess. You know what, Boyan? You must also be a psychic because how did you know I actually am a princess? That's why I'm making all these Disney princess things because I'm a princess. <laughs> but, but thank you so much. <laughs> I appreciate it. Um, yeah, so, oh yeah. For, <laughs> um, Kayla says that she needs a hoopla to match the kernel. Absolutely, because you can actually wear the hoopla over the kernel. And, oh, Kayla's going to be first line for the midnight release. So, yeah, guys, get your tickets. Midnight release. I love it. <laughs> um, oh, and T, T wheels or TW heels, maybe T wheels. You guys can help me out here. Um, the T wheels thought I was a fairy forest spirit. You know what? I can be both. I can be a princess fairy forest spirit. I feel like that's me. T wheels. Thank you. <laughs> Yeah, thank you, T-Wheels, for acknowledging my fairy forest spirit self. I think um, I think it's the best to be a princess fairy forest spirit. <laughs> cool. Um, so the other things I was going to talk about with, um, like, patterning tutorials kind of stuff is the rest of what I've got in the works for that. So I've got a number of patterning tutorials and some that are actual patterns already out on my website and I'm adding to that. So that's something that I've really enjoyed getting into. And to be honest, I actually started on that pursuit before I seriously started the YouTube channel. And I feel like both of those together have really grown together for me and for who I am. So I have sort of that 
teacher thing going on in me. Um, I always have, I have taught, actually, I was a private tutor for a while for math and science. Um, I've actually taught in a classroom and I've done a lot of classes in the SCA. Um, I also have done martial arts. And one thing I really loved there was when I got to a high enough rank to start teaching the younger ranks. Um, just like everywhere I go, I really enjoy that teaching aspect. So being able to release patterns and instructions and kind of going that direction with videos to inspire others is something that helps me to feel fulfilled as well. So that's something I'm continuing to build up. Um, obviously, I love to make beautiful things, but I also get a lot of satisfaction out of seeing other people make beautiful things with me, you know? So you guys are all a part of why I want to keep doing this and totally like blah, blah, blah. I love you rant aside. <laughs> um, a couple other things I'm working on. So the Hoopalond pattern drafting, it's basically pattern drafting instructions because it, it's got full diagrams and they're scaled, you know, but you know, they're, they're my pattern pieces. So it's basically got all the lines to tell you where to draw in your measurements so that this piece will be the right size for you. Um, so it's essentially drafting, but it, you know, it's not starting from nothing. It's starting from diagrams that are fleshed out for you. Um, so I've got that coming out. Um, which is like the curdle one, and I've got the folk dress. So I actually wrote down Boonod because, <laughs> because it's based on the Elsa dress, but it's really a folk dress, right? So it can work for any similar type of folk dress from another country, too. Um, I definitely don't want to limit it to a one specific one because I feel like it's something you can adapt with different accessories and different trims and embellishments and stuff to make any folk dress you want. Um, and that works for a lot of styles that are popular now too, that, you know, we've got the whole like cottage core, fantasy core. Um, I feel like anything core, like fairy core, witch core, like <laughs> put core at the end. Um, I feel like the folk dress kind of patterning can work for a lot of those styles too. So I think it's going to be a really good one. And that's another one I'm going to put out with like a pretty complete comprehensive instructions. Um, and then I've got a couple like medieval caps and hoods that I would like to pattern out. And right now, a lot of the ones that are actual patterns that you can print um, tend to be ones that don't need very specific sizing at this point. So things like caps and hoods are easy for me to do that with because I feel confident that, you know, there's a few sizes and it's not that hard to resize it. Right. So I got a couple more of those going on in the works in the background. Um, oh, <laughs> thank you so much. McNerdy says that that I'm a fabulous teacher and that she's never been able to draft anything successfully before. And that's see this, this is why I do this. <laughs> it's because of you guys and things like this. Um, oh, and T wheels. Thank you so much. T wheels also has loved my videos and hasn't attempted to recreate anything yet. Um, you know what? Backlogs really get us all backlogs are, they, they can have a lot of stuff in them. Um, so yeah, this is, this is what I love. I love, <laughs> I love being able to inspire you guys too. Um, and you know, there's so much out there that I think we can do that's not as hard as it looks, or it's not as hard as, I don't want to say like people make it out to be, but like if you haven't attempted something, it looks like it's hard because you don't know, right? Like you don't know how to do it. Like if I'm going to start something I've never even attempted or tried to do before, I don't, I don't know what I don't know. So it's, it can be intimidating, but so many things are, they, they don't have to be as intimidating as they seem. And I think 
drafting a pattern is one of those. So it also kind of goes with taking things in a level that works for you, right? So if you want to start drafting, starting with something on the simpler side is going to give you some of those base skills. And then increasing the difficulty of the pattern types will naturally help you progress. Um, and the same with sewing, right? Like even just using a pre-made pattern, the easier ones get you the base skills. And then as you increase your skill, you increase difficulty and it just kind of goes that way. Um, it's kind of actually been that way with me for digitizing patterns lately. So I started with <laughs> just kind of figuring out how to do it and starting with basic stuff. and since I've been building on those skills, I've been able to do slightly more difficult projects for me digitization wise, right? Like I've been able, I've been able to get faster and I've been able to do more complex things in the programs. And for me, I think that going at those levels is really important because I like to have results. And if I was going to sit here and be like, I'm going to make the most complex thing ever as my first project. I would drive myself crazy because <laughs> I would not finish it in a reasonable amount of time, but building on skills to get there, you definitely do. So, um, hello, welcome to my Ted talk <laughs> on building your skills. Apparently, um, Oh, Boyan, you're so sweet. <laughs> I do. Well, I want to say I try to be a good lady, but actually, I just try to be me. So <laughs> here I am. Take it or leave it. <laughs> Hopefully you take some inspiration. Um, so those are mostly the big announcements that I've got. Um, let me see. I, I hit on all these. There's more stuff coming up. But those are sort of the big things and the next things. <laughs> I have that thing where my mind just goes and goes and goes and I get like 10,000 ideas all the time. So I actually have to keep writing them down and let them sit for a while and see what turns into a project. And that way I don't have 10,000 projects all the time like I used to. <laughs> um, but on that note, you know, having too many projects is something I can relate to very, very much. Like right now, so underneath this table that the um, camera and computer and everything is sitting on, I have started putting in progress projects and it's already full. And Obviously, like I have stuff to unpack. I haven't even unpacked the Anna fabric. Um, you know what? I totally forgot to tell you guys about that I didn't write down on my list. That's in something underneath the table here is I'm actually working on a corset. So I know I haven't done a lot of corset stuff lately because I've been kind of doing medieval stuff. And, you know, corsets are not medieval. So. Now, there's a word corset in some medieval texts, but that's a whole nother tangent. But this corset is like a very artistic, aesthetic thing that I've been working on. And it's inspired by, okay, so we're going to bring everything together here. So that whole like fairy forest spirit thing coming back, this is why. So um, the there's a lot of mother nature goddesses in different pantheons and stuff. So I decided to look into the Norse goddess of nature, who is Jord, which is like an old Norse, basically the earth, right? So this is going to be a very artistic corset that's inspired by essentially Scandinavian nature. And it's a way that I thought I could bring together some of the fantasy corset stuff and some of the... The things I love in more like of an artistic sense with a corset and also um, there's been some getting into like exploring the Scandinavian stuff um, 
And that's something I feel close to because I've spent a lot of time in Sweden. So it's something like, you know, it is my heritage. Like my mom is literally from Sweden, but it's also like, because I've been there a lot, it's something that I've always felt connected to and felt like at home, like we would always go like hiking in the woods, like picking berries and stuff like that. Um, and that, so that earth, in addition to all of earth, <laughs> we can't exclude all of earth. I'm all inclusive to earth here. Earth is very special to me. And I think that's going to be really cool. Um, that project is kind of on the back burner, but I'm very excited about it still. And actually I need to do it because I have a lot of like faux foliage that I collected for it. And that faux foliage is taking up a lot of space and I would like to free up that space. So something I should get on. Um, another thing that I didn't write down is also another course that it's technically stays because it's based on, you know, the 18th century. So that was called stays before we were using the term corset for the bone garments. And I did complete that. The reason I haven't put the video together is because I completed it with a friend of mine when I was up in Washington in March. And my friend hasn't quite completed hers yet. And I was hoping to put hers like a final photo of hers in the video as well, because I thought that would be cool to kind of see like someone who is newer to sewing because I actually taught her how to make it versus, you know, something that I did that I've made before. Right. Um, well, OT Wills asks, is it berry picking season in your part of the world? Oh, in Virginia. Oh, this is cool. You've got mulberry, blueberry, and blackberries are starting to come in and tail and a strawberry. That's so awesome. That sounds delicious, by the way. I would love to come over and go pick all the berries and eat them. So here, I actually am going to be very interested to learn a little bit more about the local berry seasons. So we just moved. Um, I'm in the Houston area right now. and I know that, well, I didn't move from very far, but, or did I move from not very far? <laughs> Told you guys I'm the dad. So I know that strawberry season here is on the tail end too. And um, <laughs> we don't have a lot of the berries down here because the climate is very warm and humid. And so some of the berries, that I think of like the blackberries and the blueberries and the huckleberries, which I, I, you guys in the last couple of years, I just learned what a huckleberry is. So this is, this is like a testament to growing up with parents from different places, maybe because <laughs> we would pick blueberries right in Sweden. And I knew what blueberries were since I was a little kid. And, you know, my mom knew what blueberries were. And so in Sweden, you have a lot of like really little blueberries. Oh yeah. Huckleberries are, huckleberries are a real thing. I didn't know. So you have really little blueberries a lot of times in Sweden. So in the forest there, they're full of like blueberry bushes and stuff. And here the blueberries are usually bigger so I just thought they were all blueberries. And it turns out that those really little ones, when they grow in the U.S., are called huckleberries. And I did not know. Now I know. They're usually a little bit sweeter than the big blueberries. And I like them a lot. I think they're delicious. A service berry. I actually have not heard of a service berry before. It's a tree. Oh, wow. In Asheville. Yeah, Asheville is really cool, too. Um, I've only been there one time to Asheville, and I quite enjoyed it. Obviously, like, having that artist thing. I know, like, you guys know about costuming. I'm definitely an artist soul. And I went when they had the art walk and it was fan fantabulous. <laughs> I think that's the best word. Um, yeah, I'll have to look up service berry. Oh, 
Oh, thank you so much. Mayo, is it Mayo Inspire? Um, it says that I'm a boon of knowledge. I'm, I got a boon. <laughs> but this is my boon pose. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I really love inspiring people. And your, so your Daenerys cosplay closet sounds amazing already. And I'm so glad that that's becoming a reality because how awesome like to have a Daenerys cosplay closet it's gonna be so good I'm so ready for it and please share actually all of you guys please share like if you have some projects that you're excited about I would always love to see them so yeah and of course I'm a fan of Daenerys um I've done a few Daenerys inspired dresses myself too and I think that style is very very good Um, oh, nice. So the service berry is a cross between a cherry and a blueberry. Wow, that sounds really intriguing. I would love to actually try a service berry. Oh, Marla. <laughs> yeah, Marla. Um, yeah, smocking is definitely an intense skill and I'm so glad that my tutorial helped you. So the dragon skill smocking is very characteristic for Daenerys. They use that a lot in the Game of Thrones show and I think it's very worthwhile. Oh yeah, we're gonna go back to service berries for a second. Um, so it's between cherry and blueberry and flavor, not genetics. <laughs> that is a good specification. Um, I was thinking flavor, but with like a, a science background, you never know. You know, could be <laughs> genetics. Um, yeah, and uh, with the smocking, yeah, the it, it is intense. It can take a lot of time and the result definitely worth it um yeah, bye marla marla's heading out cool so yeah it's been a, just slightly over an hour now so what i want to do is make sure if you guys have any questions that we address those questions too so I know I'm a little bit delayed. So if I'm like, do you have any questions? No, bye. There's probably going to be some. So we'll talk for a minute, more than a minute. We'll talk for a bit and, you know, you guys can put in any questions you have or anything you want to address. And we will kind of get to anything that will help you guys as we start to wrap up. Um, as you can see, I've been very productive at sewing this. I sewed those three stitches. So I think three stitches per hour. How productive do you guys think that is? That That's pretty good, right? <laughs> oh my goodness. So yeah, how was the move? The move was, you know, it was, it was a move. Um, oh, and Boyan says, corset is beautiful on everyone or every lady. I think, yeah, everyone can be so beautiful in a corset. I think that's something that, you know, clothes in general, corsets are definitely something that you see a lot. Um, but clothes can make you feel really beautiful and really like yourself. <clears throat> Excuse me. I'm getting myself hoarse again. <clears throat> yeah, moving went moving went <laughs> pretty well as far as actually like relocating to the new space. And I'm being pretty slow in actually like setting everything up and getting settled here. Um it we had a little bit of help because my partner actually was relocated for his job. So they actually work 
because they wanted him to move very quickly. Um, actually, it was only a few weeks before we knew that we were moving until we were moved, basically. So they have a service that helps you with the actual moving of like boxes and furniture and stuff. Um, so that was actually extremely helpful. It's just kind of like getting everything situated and moving in and figuring out the new place. So we're back in a city, um, a very good city. I actually, as far as I have experienced, I'm kind of a fan of Houston. I think it's got a lot of resources and, you know, there's airports. I can get to other places if I want to. Like it's somewhat central. Obviously it's in the South, but like you can get to a lot of places from here. The food is great. Um, I missed a lot of (laughs) types of food that we didn't have in the last place, which was kind of small. So I'm excited about that. I'm kind of looking around at different areas where I can do photo shoots and reveals of costumes and stuff like that. I already have a few spots picked out and I really like them. And there's surely a plethora of amazing spots around here. So I'm very excited. Um, Houston also has some really good museums. Um, The, let's see, the Natural Science Museum it usually has an Egyptian exhibit. Like it's one of the larger Egyptian exhibits. And so I've been to it before and it's currently closed for renovations. I actually went yesterday to the museum district and that one, I'm excited for it to reopen and see what the renovations are. Um, The Museum of Fine Arts Houston is amazing. It's huge. It's got all kinds of art. There is Renaissance art. There's a few Egyptian things. The bigger exhibit is at the Science Museum. There's like a whole section of like Islamic arts. They have like, so a a little bit away from costuming into my science nerdiness. Um, There was a lot of scientific discovery in the Middle Eastern region in what we know as the Middle East. Middle Ages period. And they have a lot of stuff like that at the museum as well, which is very, very interesting to me. Um, So I'm very excited about the move and rambling about how much cool stuff is around me. So I just need to set up my space and get my button gear. Um, Oh, my favorite Disney villain. This is a really good question because I have actually not thought about who's my favorite Disney villain very much. Um, I did see the new Cruella movie and I wouldn't have said this before based on the animated film, but I think now based on the new film, I think it's Cruella actually. I think she's my favorite. And it's probably also related to how fashionable she is. Like, I really love that artistic fashion sense. So I like her. Um, yeah, I, <laughs> T-Wheels got my back here on <laughs> um, how hard it is to sew well your chatting and reading live chats and stuff. Um, and also. Oh, thank you. Yeah, there's so apparently there's an amazing quilt show down here with great fabric vendors. That would be awesome. I'd love to check that out. Yeah, so I'll have to look into that. Um, So like a Houston quilt show. One of the biggest and best in the country. That's amazing. Yeah, this is a really a really good kind of hub city. Um, I know it's one of the larger cities in the country and I like it a lot because it has a lot of stuff, but it's also spread out enough that, um, so I used to live in LA for a while and I felt like I was always having trouble getting anywhere or doing anything because there was so much traffic and Somewhere like here, there's traffic, but it's not like running your life, basically. Like I drove quite far yesterday 
And while there was some traffic, I didn't feel like it stopped me. (laughs) You know, it was just kind of like a little bit here and there. So I, I think this is awesome. And I'll have to check out that quilt show. Obviously, if there's fabric vendors, you've got my attention. Awesome. Yeah, Cruella was really awesome. I really liked it. Definitely a new fave for me in um, Disney movies. Um, yeah, I just, I'm a, such a sucker for the aesthetic artistic things in films. Like I love obviously costuming, but like really artistic costuming really gets me. So I like things that are historical. Obviously I'm really into the middle ages and Renaissance, but what really always gets me is fantasy costuming. So whether historical or not, like historical costumes that have a fantasy component to them also absolutely love it. Um, And that's the main reason why I would watch a lot of things, honestly. Um, Cool. Yeah, so I'm going to sew another stitch here. Look at this. So productive. So I can't tell you guys when the strawberry dress is going to be done because I'm not rushing it. Um, Just kind of sewing it little by little as I can. And it did kind of get pushed to the back burner again with Cruella because the movie just came out and I'm super excited about it. So I wanted to make the dress. Um, She's like... I want to come out soon, Cruella, soon. Soon you will be released. Awesome. So do you guys have any more questions or anything that you want to talk about? Anything you want to share? I feel like it's so weird, you know, because I can see myself. I can't see you guys, but I can see all your chat messages. (laughs) Yeah, the wig, this, my Cruella wig is um, super fun. Actually, that was, it was super fun to get all the black and white on the right sides because um, it came with some of it mixed together in the back. And I wanted to make sure because I was putting it up, you know, in these crispinets. Thank you. I called them hair nets earlier. They're actually crispinets. Um, which is a type of hairnet, right? So I had to make sure I had all the white on one side and all the black on the other side. So I did it though. Got it. Um, and with the crispinets, I kind of made them work. And for now, I'm going to put that up on Patreon. Um, not immediately, right? Like it won't be like leave the live stream and it's up, but you know, in the next couple weeks or so, I'll be working on getting that up there. Um, I don't feel like it's as comprehensive and polished as like something that I've been putting out in the more finished tutorials. Um, So right now it's going to go up there and I'll have a little bit about it in the YouTube video as well. So I did film some of making them. So that'll be coming up to go with the Hoopalant. Um, oh, Anna is asking about puffed up sleeves and a blouse. Okay, this one, I feel like I need like to draw stuff out. And I, I feel like this answer is going to be something we can't get totally in depth right here, right now. Um, but I can give you some tips. So puffed up sleeves, there's basically two ways to get volume in sleeves. So one is by making it wider and the other is by making it taller. So it kind of depends how you want to puff them up. But, oh yeah, McNerdy mentioned the slash and spread method. So yeah, if you search in YouTube slash and spread method, that's going to help you 
to slash and spread your pattern pieces. So if you want to make them, you know, taller, you can slash them to be taller. If you want to make them just wider, you can slash them to be wider. Um, oh yeah, <laughs> I could make a video about it later to go in depth. That's true. I could, that's actually a good idea. I should write down. Um, those puff sleeves are super cool. And there's so many different ways to make puff sleeves. So essentially, you're going to need to gather them at the top and maybe even gather them at the bottom. If they're really big, definitely you want to gather them top and bottom. So you need it to be long enough that you can gather in what you want. And usually you have to add height as well. Um, but the ratio depends. So I mean, because if you take something and, you know, you squish it up, you kind of want some more height as well. I don't know if that helps. Um, yeah, I would definitely look for slash and spread to modify the sleeve patterns that you do have if you already have one. I feel like that's a good starting point. Um, awesome. All right, so we're an hour and 15 minutes in. I'm actually having a lot of fun. I feel like <laughs> this is super cool. Um, maybe we should do more lives. I know I say that and then I'm going to come out with like all these video ideas and I would have 10,000 things to do again. But this is definitely really fun. I really enjoyed hanging out with you guys and, you know, getting all, all the questions and updates and stuff going. Um, yeah, do you guys have any last thoughts or anything else that you want, you like, touched on or explained in some way? Otherwise, I think I got through all the updates on stuff that's coming out soon. Uh, so in another stitch. <laughs> so I can give you guys a minute in case anyone is typing anything. Um, just because I know I don't see it immediately. Awesome. And then after this, <laughs> yeah, every stitch counts. It's true, especially when you have a lot to, to go still. Um, yeah, after this, I'm going to work on getting myself together in the sewing room a little bit as I kind of work on some of the next projects. And... You know, who knows what else will come out in between those projects, too, because another thing is I like being able to put out a stuff that's not necessarily a whole project sometimes, but shares something like maybe a technique or maybe it's just like a discussion about something. Um, for example, there's a lot of stuff that I can share about, like getting dressed in different layers for the medieval costumes I already have made and stuff like that. And um, another thing is some of the undergarments for medieval costumes. There's like a few different ways that I wear undergarments with some similar period stuff. So you never know what's going to come out in between the projects <laughs> with little extra discussion type stuff. Cool. Awesome. Well, this has been so super fun. Um, so in addition to sewing, I need to finish up my Hoopalond instructions. So that will come out for you guys real soon. And work on the folk dress instructions. And sew all the things. <laughs> and finish moving into my space. <laughs> cool. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap us up. I'm so excited. Thank you guys so much for coming. And I will see you guys again really soon.
probably the next time I see you will be as Cruella. So imagine my face instead of that weird, creepy, blank mannequin face. <laughs> That'll be the next way I appear, probably. All right. I hope you guys have an amazing day, a magical day, and I will see you again. Oh, I forgot. Like, I have the whole, like, end of YouTube video thing, right? Um, find me on all the social medias. I'm Daisy Victoria everywhere. <laughs> Um, my website is daisyvictoria.com <laughs> and, um, I look forward to seeing you guys again real soon. All right. Bye-bye.